All right. Thank you so much, Joe. And, and thank you, everybody, for attending today. My name is Jerry Silverman. You can see my little headshot. I am a solutions engineer, meaning that I, uh, I kind of focus on the web creative suite products, which is Flash, Dreamweaver, uh, Fireworks, Contribute. But this one is going to be about Flash. So uh, that's what the box looks like. And the, uh, kind of the, the, the four main areas that we're going to cover today uh, about the new revisions to Flash CS3 center on uh, the integration uh, that Flash CS3 now has with the rest of the Adobe product line, um, including Illustrator and Photoshop, uh, the creative flexibility that's afforded through all kinds of uh, video importing um, and uh, rectangle and uh, shape primitives. Uh, you've got a, a very productive development environment, and we're going to go through uh, some of the development enhancements in the Flash uh, development environment. And uh, we're also just going to take a peek at uh, Device Central, which is a very powerful way if uh, you happen to be developing for mobile, which is a, a huge uh, developing market right now, uh, you're able to test your Flash presentation on a myriad of different um, kind of emulated devices uh, without having to go out and buy uh, hundreds of handsets. So when we talk about Adobe integration, right, we now have the ability, and I'm going to show you some of the finer points of this uh, in our demo, uh, to import native Photoshop and Illustrator files into Flash CS3. This is probably one of the greatest new features of Flash CS3. And, and, and since it's launched, uh, it, it's one of the things that we've gotten some of the best feedback on. And if, if you look on the web today, you're going to see that uh, customers are taking advantage of this feature like never before. And I mean, even in the beginning when uh, Flash uh, was acquired, when Macromedia was acquired by Adobe, um, it, it, was, it was the case that Illustrator and Photoshop users were bringing their comps and their art into Flash, but this just made it a whole lot easier. And uh, the copy and paste functionality is there. Um, you also have the ability to work with other Adobe products, such as After Effects, Premiere, and Sound Booth, in your uh, ability to bring in cue points. And we're going to see what that looks like a little bit. Um, let's see. Right, we've got this great new... Uh, additions to the pen tool, which makes it work and feel a lot like the pen tool in Illustrator, which uh, many Illustrator uh, users who are designing with the pen tool say is, is very, very similar. And uh, it's one of the most powerful drawing tools in the Illustrator tool set. And so bringing that over to Flash uh, just, just makes that transition all that much easier. Uh, you've got shape primitives, which allows you to do those rounded rectang rectangle boxes that everyone uh, has just been clamoring for. And uh, you're able to um, create, oh, did my screen go away? You're able to create um, shape primitives that you can control parameters of them within the properties inspector as opposed to, uh, you can still do it with ActionScript, of course, but uh, being able to control those within the properties inspector is, is a real uh, time saver, and it's also very visually uh, appealing for designers. Um, you've got nine slice. Uh, live rendering, which is your ability to intelligently scale vector images um, and bitmap images uh, according to nine slice guides, which we're going to look at. Um, you've got a whole new set of ActionScript 3 based components, uh, which make the, if, you, if you're a, an, an IA or if you're into uh, wireframing or flowcharting, um, or if you want to make a complete interactive mock-up or, or click-through, or if you just want to uh, take the component logic and uh, customize the look and feel yourself, um, you're able to do that very uh, effortlessly with these new components. And as you uh, see here, you're all, we also have a very sophisticated video encoding uh, with the cue points that we mentioned before and uh, a, a lot of other features. So uh, when it comes to development, there's a lot of new features as well. And I'm, I'm just going to buzz through these because uh, I do want to get into the demo. But you're able to, um, you're basically able to copy motion that you've created in a tween as action script or just copy that motion straight over and apply it to other, uh, other elements, other movie clips on, uh, on your stage. And uh, there's a lot of new programming tools and uh, workspace customization that, uh, that's 
gives you uh, a lot more real estate on, real estate on your screen, and, and we're going to see that. And then, of course, Device Central, which I had mentioned before, and, and we're going to walk through uh, that particular demo right there. So let's just get right on into it. I'm going to get out of full screen for a second. All right. So uh, if everybody can see where I am, I am now going to go over into Illustrator to start off our Flash demo. And the reason for that is because when we were polling for CS3, we saw that, uh, as I mentioned, so many uh, Flash designers use Illustrator. And uh, so we built some tools right into Illustrator that make coming over to Flash uh, a lot more easy. And uh, w one of those is the inclusion of Flash symbols. And as you can see, I'm, I, I'm not going to be able to zoom in, but you see we've got uh, a whole bunch of different symbols. These are native Flash symbols. Illustrator now supports native Flash symbols. And uh, you can create those symbols the same way that you create, uh, create them in Flash, just by hitting the F8 key. Right, I just hit F8, and you can create a new symbol. You can turn it into a movie clip, just like uh, you would in Flash. You can, uh, you know, set the Flash registration point and, and give it a name. And then once you drag out your symbol to to this page, excuse me, you're uh, you're able to, um, you know, create instances, and you can name those instances. Right, if I'm just going to call this the tree instance up here. Um, as you can see, those instance names and symbols will come over when you import this into Flash. So that's a, a pretty big time saver right there. Um, you know, for those who, who may not be so familiar with uh, what, what a symbol is, it's basically a reusable object. Um, and if I were to, in my symbols panel uh, over here in Illustrator, if I were to just double click in there, as you can see, I'm entering symbol isolation mode or symbol editing mode, which is the same uh, pr pretty much the same as, as what you get in Flash when you double click on a symbol in the library or uh, you double click a symbol on the stage in Flash. Um, so I'm able to enter that mode just by, by double clicking in the symbols panel or also in the same way uh, double clicking on the artboard. I can get that, uh, that nice symbol isolation mode. And if I were to make a change to the color here, I'm just going to come over to my, uh, my live paint bucket tool, right, uh, just by hitting the K, K button. And as you, you're not going to be able to see this in Connect, but I can basically choose a swatch. Uh, you know, Connect has a different uh, cursor icon, but uh, what I'm seeing right now is a paint bucket with uh, three colors of my swatch being selected. And so I, I, just using the arrow keys, I can cycle through until I get to a nice orange that I want. And I can just fill this symbol up with orange. And then when I click back on the back arrow to Exit symbol isolation mode. As you can see, the symbol definition is changed for the entire for the entire piece. Um, another native su flash support element that we have in Illustrator is for text. So if I just kind of I'm going to zoom in a little bit here to this text, and uh, I'm just going to double click to enter symbol isolation mode. And as you can see, now that I've clicked on this piece of text up in my uh, close to my menu bar. Uh, I've got a flash text panel, so I'm going to I'm going to click on that, and I can define this as static text, dynamic text to be uh, uh, to be fed in via an XML stream or from a server. I can uh, assign it as input text that'll be uh, input by the user. This is just going to be static text. Um, but if I go go over and choose this stuff, you'll see that I've defined this as dynamic text, and this is going to be this text uh, is going to be fed by ActionScript in the the file that we're about to that I'm about to show you. So, for the action scripters, we're need, we're going to need to know what the instance name of this text field is. And so, the the instance name is uh, monster underscore dt for dynamic text. Just so the action scripter knows, this, this is a good way of of, uh, of having a, a workflow between the designers and developers uh, is to be able to define these things uh, beforehand. And you can also set the rendering type. Uh, you know, th this is going to be animated text, but if we wanted to make this a little bit more readable, we could set it for readability. And just so you know, for, for those of us in the, you know, I know at, at McGraw-Hill, we're working in the world of print, and uh, so we're very concerned about how our text is going to render in our uh, our vector drawing tool like, like Illustrator. Um, and just to kind of ease your mind on that, uh, the rendering type, if you're, if you're in the flash text uh, dialog, which also has its own panel, as you can see, um, uh, down in the right corner here, I've got the flash text panel, um, which we can also get to by going to window, which doesn't seem to want to uh, click there. 
But uh, it, as, as you can see, we have a, a flash text panel down here where we can do all of those definitions. But as I was saying, these flash text rendering types only affects flash. And if you were to take this same document and go out to print or go out to PDF, um, th those rendering types are not going to affect it at all. So there's, a, there's no need to, to worry if you're going to assign uh, a type and a rendering type in the flash text uh, dialog, you're not going to affect uh, print or PDF. So let's bring this design into Flash now. Now, uh, before we do that, just to, to draw your attention to the fact that uh, I'm just going to collapse this panel and collapse this panel, and that was done just by clicking on the top of the panel. That's a very fun, fun way to kind of uh, maximize your, your real estate in your panels is just to click once on them. As you can see, I've got a huge hierarchy here. And uh, I don't know about you, but but when I would work in Flash back in the the MX 2004 days and the Flash 8 and the the you know C, Adobe CS and CS2, I would create these very kind of structured hierarchies in my Illustrator file or in my Photoshop file, um, and then bringing it over to Flash uh, or Director or, or whatever interactive application I, I was using at the time was always extremely um, unsettling because you'd, you'd work on very delicately naming your folders and your layers, uh, you know, just to kind of preserve that transferability between your designer and developer, then my developer would get this file and have to painstakingly recreate the, uh, the folders uh, and the layer hierarchies in Flash. And now all we have to do is come over. I've, as you see, I've got a, a, just a brand new document, except I've got... Um, an action script in here, and if I open up my actions frame, you can see that I'm including uh, a, a .as file, and a .as is just like a, a .txt or a, a .doc. It's, it's, just a, it's just a specific action script file that is associated um, with this uh, drawing that we have. And remember, in the Illustrator file, we gave all of our trees and all of our planes and our, our Godzilla monster, we, we gave those all uh, symbol definitions, and we also gave uh, the symbols that were on the, the canvas of the artboard, we gave those instance names. And so the action script file that we have associated to our document here has those instance names in mind. And so when I go to File, Import, Import to Stage, right, that's also just a Command R or a Control R on the PC. I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, just select my... Uh, monster file, and go ahead and import, and I'm going to get the import from Illustrator to stage dialog box. And as you can see, if I just go ahead and, and collapse these, you can see that my hierarchy is beautifully, wonderfully, excellently preserved, right? We've got all, all of our trees that, that we saw before. Um, now, these have not been converted into symbols, but some of our stuff already has been con converted into symbols. So, uh, right, like our trees front, as you can see, you've got that uh, little gear symbol, which uh, which lets us know that not only is it a symbol, but it also has the instance name of tree. So uh, so that's very useful for us. And if I wanted, I could just shift and select all of these and create them all as movie clips. I'm not going to do that uh, at this point, but it's just so useful to know that, that that's a possibility. And as you can see, we've got uh, a little yellow triangle down here with an incompatibility report. And when I click on that, uh, Flash is going to tell me, since it has a different rendering engine than, uh, than Illustrator, there's going to be some uh, blend modes, maybe secondary blend modes that, that won't come on over, or live effects. So, uh, you know, there's something that says apply recommended import settings down here. And you could do that, but whenever you get this type of error, it's probably advisable to go ahead and export out of Illustrator and bring that into Flash separately. Um, an another thing that you might see is uh, th the file that you're trying to import is CMYK, and as we know, web is an RGB uh, color space. So uh, I recommend doing that transfer, the CMYK to RGB transfer, um, with from within Illustrator and then importing rather than allowing Flash uh, to do it for you. But uh, you know, I, I think your mileage may vary. So if we want to convert all of these layers to individual keyframes because we're going to be doing lots of tweening within each of the individual layers, then we can convert these 
the, the illustrator layer is two keyframes, um, or we can kind of group it all into, into one single flash layer. But for the purposes of our, our example, we're just going to keep them as flash layers. And uh, we want to place the object at the original position, and we can set the stage size to the same size as the Illustrator artboard. So I'm going to go ahead and click OK. And as you can see, I'm just going to show the timeline in Flash. And for those of us who aren't necessarily familiar with the uh, Flash timeline, uh, you can see that all of that hierarchy was preserved. I'm just going to drag my actions level all the way up here. And uh, as you can see, in our library panel, I'm just going to double click and look inside our Illustrator symbols. And all of those movie clips that we had and all of the graphical assets have been brought in and they're, they're nicely named, which is really great. And uh, also, the, the hierarchy in the timeline is preserved. And uh, as you can see, everything's been put on the stage. And the stage has actually been resized. If I just go ahead and double click on my, uh, I can say, modify document or command or control J on a PC. Or I can double click and have a look. Originally, this was a 550 by 400 uh, flash project, but it's been resized to 800 by 600. So now if I go ahead and I say uh, test movie, which I can also do by hitting uh, command enter, you're going to see that uh, hopefully that comes in via connect, that since our action script knew the names of the instances of those objects in Flash uh, it, uh, that were created in Illustrator, we can have that very fine level of control. And uh, pretty much this, it's, it goes the same for Photoshop. If I wanted to, I'm just going to jump over to Photoshop for a second. And, uh, you know, for those of us working in Photoshop, and, and when we were polling for CS3, we, we realized that, you know, 70, 80, 90 percent of people designing in Flash do something in Photoshop or Illustrator first. So, uh, but they, want, they wanted more than just the ability to bring over the graphics. They wanted to be able to preserve text, editable text, right? As you can see, we've got uh, quite a bit of editable text in here. Um, in, uh, on the navigation and, and here and, and in the tagline. Um, we also have a, a, we have a vector mask right up here in the corner. As you can see, right, the green corner, I'm just uh, I'm pointing at it. And uh, if I right click, you can see that it's a, it's a vector mask. So we want to be able to keep the scalability of that vector mask when we bring it in because Flash is, after all, a natively uh, vector design uh, program. We also have these water drops here, which if I right click and uh, have a look at the pattern, we can see that uh, just in our layers panel over here, we can see that it has a multiply blend mode attached to it. So, uh, you know, blend modes are basically allow layers to interact with uh, the pixels of one layer to interact with the pixels on a, a layer beneath it. So we could change this to a whole lot of different blend modes, and you can see it updating uh, right over there in Photoshop. But uh, you know, users of Flash want to be able to preserve that as well. So if I were to come over to Flash and just do the, the very same uh, import to stage, right, and I'm going to bring in that Photoshop file. And uh, so that green corner, right, it, as you can see, the hierarchies are all preserved just as they were in Illustrator. I can preserve that green corner that we had as an editable path. Uh, so we'll be able to kind of scale that uh, as a vector without losing any resolution. Um, if I go into nav, right, we've got those text fields, uh, right, clear, red, and green. If I wanted to just grab all of those, shift select all of those, and, and import them as editable text, that is a great new feature of uh, a Flash CS3. Uh, we're also able, right, we, we had our, our video pattern down here, and if I wanted to bring that in with the layer style and the blend mode saved, I would just import it as with editable paths and blend modes. Now, uh, I'd also be able to, if, uh, if these guys were all selected here, I could just kind of collapse them down by saying merge layers. I'm, I'm not going to do that. But, uh, you know, if, if you're a designer, uh, or if you're a designer and like to have everything on its own layer, but it doesn't have to be that way, you can reduce it, it within Flash you can uh, reduce the complexity by just clicking Merge Layers. So, right, we're not going to be tweening between a lot of these layers here, so we're just going to keep them as flash layers. We're going to set the stage size to the same and click OK. And there we have it. It's our, 
right? We've still we've retained all of the hierarchy that we had in our Photoshop document. So uh, so now, as you can see, I'm just going to double click on our text, and we can edit that text. And that is just so amazingly wonderful. I just I can't even you know express express to you how many hours I, I would have saved in my life in my in my previous job. Uh, had I been able to do that. And, you know, we've got that, that editable guy right up there, which is a, a vector. And uh, as you can see, if I select my water drops and I look down in my property inspector, in Flash, we've got a multiply blend mode. And we can apply different blend modes right within there, but that multiply blend mode is preserved. And, uh, you know, as are all of our kind of visual bitmap assets. Now, the link between the flash file and the Photoshop file is is no longer there. Uh, just to let you know that that uh, it's not it doesn't have a smart object functionality. So if I were to go back into Photoshop, update it, um, it's not going to automatically update in in Flash. You're going to need to do a reimport there. Um, you know, it, it, I, I think that that was probably uh, conceived of as a safety uh, functionality, so that. Uh, you know, you wouldn't make changes, and then all of a sudden your Flash project changes, and you, and you didn't want that. It's kind of a uh, a check, you know, kind of a check and balance. So as we saw in uh, the the uh, deck, the slide deck before, one of the other great new enhancements to CS3 is the video import. And so let's say our client has has a look at this, and, th and this is just kind of your your standard web banner that we're looking at right now. I'm trying to fit it in the window, so I, I guess it's fitting pretty nicely. Um, you know, let, let's say we design this out for our, our customer or for our client, and uh, the client says, yeah, it looks really great, but I, I'd really love to see what this looks like, uh, what this biker looks like with that video that we shot, uh, you know, over in, in Santa Cruz last month. So, uh, so if I wanted to do that, I could just grab that layer, and I'm just going to get rid of it because we're going to import some video uh, to place in that layer. So I just uh, hit the delete key, and we got rid of it. I'm just going to go back in and say file import video. And uh, so the import video dialog is basically your one-stop shop for getting video into Flash. And, and uh, we're going to just discuss for a very brief moment um, some of the, the features of getting video into Flash. Since Flash video uh, is the most prevalent form of video online right now, something like uh, 70 to 80 uh, percent, th there was actually a, a Comscore a poll that just came through uh, from June 2008 saying that flash video w was between 70 and 80. I don't have the exact figures uh, on me, but it was between 70 and 80 percent of all web video uh, in North America is flash video, FLV, even though uh, uh, H.264 is becoming more prevalent, the Flash Player 9 uh, has support for H.264, for certain implementations of H.264 video. So uh, we're just going to find our video file, right? We, we, uh, we shot a little bit of video and we kind of crunched it down to, uh, to encode it. And we have it as a QuickTime movie. So I'm just going to go ahead and open that up. Uh, but if we already have, let's say we have our own Flash Media server or we're contracting with a uh, content delivery network like Limelight or, or Akamai or, or, um, or Internap, and they already have, we already have a web server, uh, a streaming service. We could just give the URL for where our video is being hosted and it would, uh, Flash would know to drop that video right in here at runtime. But, uh, we're just gonna do this straight from, uh, straight from our hard drive. So I'm gonna click continue. If we wanted to do the YouTube model of progressive download where, uh, the video just comes right into the, the user's browser cache, and they can kind of go into their cache and, and appropriate that video how they want, um, then we would choose progressive download. And that's usually not bad if uh, you're not concerned with the copyright on the video. And also if uh, you, it, it's kind of a shorter video, because obviously if it's progressively downloading, you're going to be taking up space on the user's hard drive. So uh, you want to make sure that the video is a little bit shorter. If you're streaming from a, a, a Flash video streaming service or, or a Flash media server, you're not going to be taking up any space on their hard drive. And uh, it's going to be a little bit better of a user experience because uh, you'll be able to, the user will be able to point at, let's say if it's a three-minute video and they want to go to minute two 
uh, they can just point at minute two on the timeline of their video and it'll it'll jump right there and start buffering as opposed to progressive download where you have to wait for uh, all the first two minutes of your video to load before you can jump to that point. So, you know, streaming is a little bit better of an experience and it's also better for longer videos uh, because you're, you're uh, not going to be taking up room on your user's machine. If you want to embed video in your Swift, it, it's typically only recommended for very short uh, video pieces, uh, you know, only because the user will have to wait for in, an inordinately long amount of time, if it's a big video, for their SWF or their Flash presentation to load, um, you know, before they do that. So not, not recommended unless it's very small. Um, or do we want to link the QuickTime video? Right now, let, let's just do progressive. Uh, you know, the, the, the Flash video, um, the Flash, the, the import video dialog gives you uh, recommendations and lets you know what these are all about. But now that we're there, we have the deployment and the encoding dialog. So we get to select how we want to encode this video and how we want to deploy it. And uh, as you can see, uh, although the, the video update isn't going to come through Connect very well, um, we can set in and out points for this video to encode. So if we only want, uh, if this is a 10 minute video and we only want, uh, you know, three minutes of video to come in, we can just select these, these in and out sliders and, uh, and, and have a very fine tune on uh, what we're importing and outporting. And uh, the encoder has a bunch of nice presets, um, you know, medium quality, low quality, modem quality, and uh, you know, if, if, if you know what you're doing with video encoding, you might want to customize that a little bit. Or if you have a specific profile that uh, another customer or client uh, wants you to use for uh, your delivery, you can load that up by clicking on, the, uh, by clicking on the, the folder icon. Or if you customize it like we're about to do and you want to save that preset, you can just click on the, the disk icon here and, uh, and save that. So just going in, uh, just to show you a little bit, right, if, if uh, I know a lot of agencies have mandates for uh, if, if you're creating a Flash presentation that it must be viewable on Flash Viewer 8, it must be viewable on Flash, Flash Player 7, uh, which are kind of older versions of the Flash Player, but, you know, it's kind of a, a way of guaranteeing that people using older versions and older machines and older browsers um, are, are going to be able to view all of the content. So if that's the case, then you're going to want to encode uh, your Flash video with uh, Sorensen Spark as opposed to VP6. Uh, VP6 is the, the newer version of the Flash video codec, and uh, that's viewable on uh, Flash Player 8 and above. Um, Flash Player 7 and 6, you can encode to Sorensen Spark, and uh, you'll be able to get that, that, uh, that video across. But VP6 is a, at lower bit rates, it's a little bit more clear. So, uh, you know, you can also, if, if you're if you want to composite your video onto something else and you've shot with a green screen, you can encode the alpha channel. Um, if, it's, uh, if you shot it on DV, you can deinterlace it. Um, you can change the data rate if you like to, you know, kind of tweak it up and down. Um, uh, you can customize the keyframe placement to see how many frames of real video are in your video and, and you can mess with the frame rate. Um, you can also change the, the audio coding settings. You can import cue points from After Effects, from Sound Booth, from Premiere. If, say, you're doing closed captioning and uh, you have pr particular captions set up within Premiere Pro, you can export those captions as, a, uh, as an XML file, and then you can import those captions right in here. Right? As you can see, we've got an XML file. We're not going to import it because it's, it's not relevant to this particular video. But, um, and then using the FLV closed captioning component um, within Flash, you can uh, create those closed captioning very, very easily. You can also uh, just add, if I'm kind of going along within my video uh, in this dialog, and say I put it at two seconds here, I can add another cue point, right? As you can see, the cue point, uh, the cue point list is kind of filling up with the time. And uh, do I want it to be an event? In other words, do I want ActionScript to refer to this cue point? so that something within the Flash movie happens when I call this cue point, or do I want it to be more of like a, this video to have more of a DVD type of functionality where I can skip from navigation point to navigation point. So uh, that's easy. And finally, you know what, I'm going to take those cue points out because uh, there's no telling how it will affect the rest of the movie.
Um, but let's see, I, ha I have it at medium quality. And now if I want to, as you notice, there, there's some letterboxing up top. And uh, just using this very nice click and drag crop tool, if you have a look at kind of the marching ants guides that are along the edges of my video, you can see that now I'm going to be cropping the video to get rid of those black letterboxes. And I'm just going to move that up like so. And uh, as you can see, my new crop size is 400 by 264. But if I want to, let's say, uh, you know, my, my customer or my client has uh, a mandate that it must be 400 by 300, I can go ahead and resize the video to 400 by 300 and maintain the aspect ratio. Of course, uh, this video is now going to look a little bit stretched because the native size is 264 and we're stretching it up to 300, so um, everybody's going to have that elongated look. But uh, So we're not going to do that here, but if the, the client has a, a mandate to for a particular aspect ratio uh, in their video, then you, you're going to want to do that. So just clicking continue, we can skin this video with a, a player a uh, whole lot of different ways, right? As you can see, um, we can uh, choose a skin in this skin dialog, and you know it has play buttons, stop buttons, it has a, a, a progress bar, all, all built in, and uh, hovering either hovering over the video or we can have it under the video, right? And as you can see, there's there's many different controls. There's a uh, full screen control that you can have. There's a closed captioning, which works with the closed captioning component that I mentioned. There's volume, there's mute, there's, um, you know, b basically a lot of different functionalities. And we can also, uh, with this color chip, we can choose whatever color we want that to be. Um, it's not just kind of the, the pre, in Flash 8, you could really only choose, like, I don't know, six or seven colors. But uh, now we, we have uh, all, all of the RGB values we can choose. But I'm going to say none for this. Also, if you've customized your own skin, you can enter the URL for, for uh where that SWF file, uh, where that SWF skin is living, you can put it in there. So now it's done, right? And it, it tells you where the movie's going to be saved and, uh, you know, tells you what it's going to be called. And so I'm just going to click Finish. And if you happen to be uh, encoding many videos, there's something called the Flash Video Encoder, right, which I just brought up using Quicksilver, which is a, a freeware application, not, not, an, Adobe, uh, not an Adobe application, but... Um, uh, it's good for launching applications uh, just with keystrokes instead of having to hunt around down here in the uh, in the the dock or, or what have you. It's a Mac only thing. Um, so the Flash Video Encoder, which I just brought up, if you have multiple files that you want to encode, you can just go into your finder, drag them into this dialog, and then uh, hit Start Queue and go to Lunch. And that's a uh, that's very uh, quick and easy way. So now we have our. I'm just gonna maximize our screen screen real estate a little bit. Oh, hold on. I'm just going to shrink, right? And I, I just, I can expand and contract my dock just by uh, collapsing the icons there. So now I have a little bit more real estate. I'm going to zoom up and shrink my, uh, right, I'm going to shrink my timeline. I'm going to shrink my properties inspector just for a second. Well, actually, I'm going to need my properties inspector, so I'm going to make it a little bit bigger. So now we have our video. And, uh, I'm just going to shrink this down a little bit more so I can grab my video. And I'm probably going to want to apply some effects to this video uh, within Flash. So the only way that you can do that is by saying uh, modify convert to symbol and creating it as a, a movie clip. So we're just going to call it the video movie clip. All right, so there we go. And uh, I'm actually going to scale it up, right? If, if I were to test this movie right now, if I were to just say control test movie, um, as you can see, the video came in, there it is, we've got our, our biker guy jumping over the hill, and it, it's very exciting, but it doesn't really fit into the, right, we've got, it, it's a square video, and we've got a, a circular frame here, so I'm going to make that fit a little bit better, and uh, the way I'm going to do that is, first, I'm just going to open up my panels, and uh, collapse my library panel, and go to my transform panel, which you can also get to by saying uh, window, and uh, the transform is going to be in... Uh, yeah, there it is. It's uh, option T, or I'm sorry, command T. So I'm just going to scale this up a little bit. Let's call it, um, oh, I don't know, 125. And as you see, because uh, the proportions are constrained, it scales up uh, proportionally. So that's nice. And just using my arrow keys, I'm going to move it over a little bit more. So that's scaled up. Actually, you know what? Let's make it 115 because we don't need it to be that small. And I'm just moving it over here. So now I'm going to mask it, and just to, to give you an idea of 
how masks work in within Flash. Um, I'm just going to move this over here, right? We've got uh, our video, which is called Video Red, right? Just make sure that that's, that's the correct layer. So now I'm going to add over here in our Insert Layer button, I'm just going to add a new layer and call it Mask. And I'm just going to zoom out a little bit more and grab my oval tool. And I can just kind of drag out an oval like that. Right, just just the, the same way that you would in, in Photoshop or, or Illustrator or uh, what have you. But instead of just uh, leaving it like that, I'm going to right click on the mask layer and call it a mask. And now, as you can see, um, well, our, our mask is actually locked, so um, we can unlock it and we can move it around if we want to. Um, I'm just going to use the arrow keys and just move it a couple of pixels over. But, and I'm just going to relock it so, so that we can't move it anymore. But now, as you can see, uh, when I go ahead and test that movie, right, we've got that nice, that nice curvature there. And, uh, if, now if I wanted to kind of go in there, right, select that mask, and uh, I'm just going to zoom back in for a second and move it over. All right, if I wanted to select that mask and now perform some, uh, some stroke enhancements, right, as you can see, it's updating. Uh, the stroke, and uh, instead of having a solid stroke, maybe I'll I'll give it a little bit of uh, a visual curiosity, right? I, I just click the uh, the customize my stroke, and uh, are we still everybody still there? Yep. Okay. Yep. Yep. We're here. Okay. Good. So uh, so I'm just gonna make my thickness a little bit bigger here, right? Let's make it seven. Whoops. That that uh, that took a little bit too much. And, uh, right, I, I have all kinds of different, right, it can be ragged, it can be dotted. What, what, what are the different types of uh, strokes that I can apply? I can also have large dot size. Um, do I want them random sizes? Uh, do I want them sparse or dense? Right, I'm just going to say sparse with this. I'm going to say OK. I'm going to scale it up a little bit more. And now, as you're going to see, when I go ahead and test my movie again, that texture is applied to the mask, so we have that nice kind of texturing, gives it that gritty. You know, I was just out in the on the on the bike range, and I'm all kind of splattered and, and torn up, uh, you know, type of texture to it. So now the the client looks at that and they say, "Wow, that's really great!" But I want to have that that red can kind of fly in. So uh, you know, I'm, I'm sitting in my sitting in my office playing around, and I come up with a a, a nice tween, looks something like this, and I'll, I'll just show you what the tween looks like. It kind of bounces off the wall like that. Right, and as you can see, I just I just made that tween very simply by by mapping uh, my the the bo green ball object to a path. I'll just show you how to do that really quickly with uh, with making those having those effects as well. If I were to uh, just kind of go into my library here, and uh, instead of choosing the library of the file that I'm in, I can choose uh, the library of this. Uh, this movie here, which has the object already made, which is called Green Circle. So I can basically go in there and, oh, I have access to that library. So I can uh, grab my Green Circle, come on in there. Let's see. Now, this is a uh, this is an 800 by 400 uh, comp. So I'm going to go in here uh, to my modified document, and I'm going to make this 800 by 400. I'm also going to make it 30 frames per second just to get that nice fluid movement. Um, a, as you notice, um, the, the, uh, the 12 frames per second is the default, and that's, that's kind of typical for, um, you know, for what you get on uh, most web projects. But, so now that I have that, I'm going to click out here, and I'm going to say insert keyframe, right, just so I have a nice uh, kind of fluid motion there. And I'm going to make a new layer up here, and I'm going to call it my path. And I'm going to select the pencil tool, right? And that's that's a little a little large for uh, for just doing a motion path. So I'm going to make sure that it's solid. I'm just going to go like that, kind of that bouncy. And uh, as you can see, I have uh, my smooth tool. I have my if I just wanted it to look like uh, exactly the way I draw without smoothing it out, then I would choose straighten. But smooth is a way of uh, smoothing out any line that I draw. So I'm just going to do that again because I want it to kind of bounce off there. And uh, now that I've done that, I can double click on my path 
in my timeline, and I can call it a guide, right? Because that path is going to be the guide along which this ball is going to follow. So I'm just going to double click my ball layer, and that'll be the guided layer. So now when I come back here, I'm just going to grab the ball, and as you can see, it attaches right there to the beginning of the path. And I'm going to come back to the last, to the last frame, and I'm just going to attach that to the path. So, oops, I need to make a keyframe over here, right? Insert keyframe. Oh, you know what? I did it. I did it kind of backwards. I should have. Uh, I should have given the keyframe. I should have started the keyframe before I created this into a path. But uh, let's see if we if we select the path. Is there any way that I can uh, that I can remedy that? No, not right now. So the good, good thing, is, the the good part of this is, is that we already have something that's keyframed out correctly. And so if I want to copy this motion, right? The the client looks at this and they they like the motion and they like the the blending. They can go. We can. All we have to do is just double click on that layer, and I can right click and say copy motion, and come back in here. Right, and I'm going to have to turn this into a uh, movie clip, or into a symbol, or into a movie clip. So I'm just going to call it red can, and uh, I'm just going to zoom back out, move this guy over, right, and he's going to be underneath, and uh, and then I can say paste motion, right, and as we can see, we're just going to scrub through the timeline. Now we don't have other keyframes for this movie in our timeline, but as you can see, the motion is preserved and that opacity and the blur is preserved uh, very nicely. We can also, I'm just going to undo that for a second and uh, and click on that again, right, on our red can, move him back just a little bit, right click and we can say paste motion special and we can select exactly which uh, properties are getting pasted, right, the X and Y, the horizontal and vertical, uh, color filters and blend modes. And we can also override, override uh, the target scale properties and, and uh, rotation and skew properties. And so now, as you can see, um, you know, it comes in pretty much identically. So I'm going to undo that one more time because another way that we can do this for the, for the developers is I'm just going to create an actions layer, right? As you saw, I, I created a new actions layer. And I can take this. And, and right click, right? I'm just right clicking and say copy motion is action script three. Um, and what is the instance name that we're going to apply this to? I'm going to call it red can again and come back and give this red can an instance name of red can within flash, right? So now I can just come into my, actually I'm going to close that up, come into my actions panel and I'm just going to tear this off so that we can see it a little better. And there's our actions panel. And uh, oh, you know what? Before I do that, I am just going to minimize that, roll up, and make sure that I have my actions layer selected because we're going to be pasting this into our actions layer. It's always the best practice uh, when you're applying action script to um, a, a particular element on your page to have a, a special actions layer up top. So all, I'm, all I have to do is right-click in here and say paste, and all of that animation is copied in here. Now it looks a little bit scary since it's about, uh, it looks to be about 400 lines, but this is all XML. Um, well, at least most of it is. If I, uh, if I go all the way up and select, and I, sorry, sorry if this is uh, giving anybody uh, vertigo from doing all this selection, but if I go up in here and I can just, uh, using this uh, code collapse, I can just collapse that code very nicely, you can see that we really only have a little bit of action script and using the X, um, the E4X system in action script three, which is the, the newest version of action script, uh, the XML is working through that, uh, so that it's parsed as XML and not as one big string, um, within action script three. So that actually improves the performance and the, it's, it's very lightweight. And as you can see, we have, uh, built in classes in action script three that deal, um, with XML as this, uh, this E4X syntax, so, so that's very nice. And um, so now that we're done, um, you know, we, we could just comment it all out, but uh, we're not going to right now. But the, the, we, we've got code commenting abilities 
right? We can apply just a, a block comment here and, and uncomment, and that, that's new in the uh, Actions panel in uh, Flash CS3. So I'm just going to dock that back down here in my panels and uh, open that back up. And so now when I go ahead and test my movie, you can see, right, so we've got all of those properties brought over. But it's still not running very nicely because I forgot to uh, change my frame rate over to 30. I'm going to go ahead and do that now, right? And there we go. We've got that nice fluid motion and the video. And, uh, you know, one thing I, I neglected to show you on the video was how to change the, uh, the, the filters on the video. Um, but, you know, that, that's something, if you're, if you're curious about it, send me an email, and, and I'm happy to, to talk about how, how you can uh, do those filters in uh, just using the Property Inspector and the Parameters uh, panel in the Properties Inspector dialog. So, uh, you know, before we open it up for questions, because I know we're, we're, we're getting kind of towards the end, and I, I did want to show nine slice scaling and the drawing tools, um, I'm just going to show you really quick the new pen tool, right, which we've got up here, which uh, you're able to use to very easily make the same sorts of drawings that you can make in Illustrator. Um, you can also copy and paste vector, vector pieces, uh, direct, vector objects directly from Illustrator into Flash, but if you're just in the mood to make a very quick uh, vector drawing, and actually this is, let's redo that and make the, the lines a little bit bigger so you can actually see them. Right? All I'm doing is just clicking around inside of our, uh, on our stage, and I can use that, and I can just make another point inside just by clicking on the lines here. And uh, these points that I'm creating with the pen tool are, are corner points, but if I come up and use my sub-selection tool, right, I can just click on that point and drag it, and as you can see, it is a corner point. But if I hold down my Alt or my Option key, I can turn it into a center point, and I have Bezier handles just the way that I did, uh, just the way that I do in um, in Illustrator. And uh, you know, the default for the Bezier handles is that they are uh, kind of snapped together and linked. But if I hold down my Option or my Alt key, um, I can unsnap them and kind of use them like that. Now, one of the big feature enhancements that, that uh, users have asked for a lot. Um, is being able to create rounded rectangles. And uh, the rectangle and the oval primitive tools are new drawing tools in CS3 that allow you to do that very, uh, very cleanly. I'm just going to make a, uh, a rectangle with a red fill here um, just, to, just to illustrate to you how easy this is going to be. And so now that I've made that with my, uh, my rectangle primitive tool, I'm just going to go up and I'm going to hold down my option key um, and click one of these corner points and kind of drag inwards. And as you can see, I can make that nice rounded rectangle without any effort. And it used to be such a, such a pain and hassle to do that within Flash itself. And so I can also, I'm just going to zoom in to, to this corner for a moment. Um, I can also kind of change, as you can see, I, I now have a rounded, a rounded corner of that, uh, of that rectangle. Um, I can also bevel it. Um, I can also miter it, and I can control if I have a, a miter value of zero, it does the same thing as beveling. But if I give it a miter value of three, it does that. And I can also control um, how, if I'm just creating uh, vectors and lines, um, how I can uh, control what the end of that line is going to look like. So I'm just going to zoom back out here. And right, so we've made the rectangle primitive. We also are able to create oval primitives, which are very fun. Um, oh, it looks like I've already, right, so this, I'm going to make sure that I'm closing my path and my inner radius is down to, well, let's, let's make it zero. And uh, actually, I did want to close the path. Huh. Hold on one second here. Just, uh, oh, I see why, because I already had my start angle already set to, let's have my start angle set to zero. And my end angle starts to zero, so it makes a full circle. So uh, let's, let's try that one more time. Just drag out a, an oval like that. As you can see, I was playing with it a little bit beforehand. But uh, just by grabbing my selection tool and holding down Alt, I can change the inner diameter. And uh, in the Properties Inspector down here, I can also uh, make sure that it's a closed path or an open path. And I can set the start angle or end angle um, of my of my path here, which is very nice. And then if I want to close that up, I can, uh, you know, make a, if anybody, we have any Chicago Cubs fans, um, you know, you can make a very easy Chicago Cubs 
type of thing, and I can uh, change the stroke and kind of scale that up and down and, and have some very, very fun, very nice, uh, very easy effects. Uh, so I see that we're coming up, we're coming up pretty, pretty quickly on uh, the, the, the end of the discussion here. I did want to go through nine slices and device central, but um, maybe I should open it up and see who wants to, who has any questions or, you know, if I should, if I can go a few minutes over. Is, is there any uh, is there any feedback so far uh, in terms of uh, you know maybe maybe going a few minutes over or uh, or if there are any questions at this point? You can keep going. Yeah, I think we can keep going. Yeah, I mean it's it's really only going to be another uh, you know two or three minutes to get through the rest of the features and then we can kind of round it up with with all of our questions together. Okay. Okay. Sound good? Yep. Sure. All right. So uh, so just want to show you uh, the new component feature set. Right, so if I uh, if I have my components panel open here, as you can see, if you're a Flex developer, um, there you have a, a Flex component base that's available to you. Um, if you have installed uh, the Air, uh, you know Air authoring for Flash, you can create uh, Air applications, which is the Adobe integrated runtime, um, and you have access to that stuff. And but what I wanted to show you just very easily uh, are some of the user interface components, which are basically graphics that are bound up with ActionScript 3 classes and then packaged together in these components. And there's a lot of different ones. We, we have the video, as I was uh, talking to you about the, the FLV playback, the captioning component uh, for closed captioning, uh, just to show you how easy it is to, to create a button, um, you know, and you can change the, the parameters of that button, you know, how it's previewed and, you know, what the label is and label placement and all, all kinds of different parameters of that button down here in the properties inspector. But um, if I wanted to you know, double click on there and change, basically skin this button uh, very easily, I could come in here to this map and skin it. So uh, let's say I wanted the overstate, instead of being, uh, instead of being this color, I just wanted it to be, I wanted the whole thing, hmm, that doesn't seem to be allowing me to select it. Let's see if I just select the whole thing, there we go. Let's say I just wanted to fill it with red and then Come on back, right? I'm, I'm just going to come on out of there. And if I run that movie, and now I roll over it, you can see the whole thing turns red. So it's very easy with a lot of these different components to kind of double click and get all of the, the different properties and, uh, and change those out very easily. Another thing that a lot of uh, uh, designers uh, clamored about was the ability to scale uh, vector objects and bitmap objects intelligently. And uh, so, you know, let's say if I'm creating this email form within Flash and, uh, you know, I have this kind of pre-baked component. Uh, th this, this particular component, if I look at my library, is called uh, tabs. And you can see it. I'm, I'm just going to drag another one to the stage to see what, it's, it's, what it default, the default looks like, right? So we, we've got pretty much the default view of it here. If I go to my properties, whoops, sorry. If I right-click on the tab and, and go into my properties, I'm going to enable guides for nine slice scaling all the way down at the bottom. We can see that it's a movie clip, but I'm going to enable guides for nine slice scaling. Well, actually, before I do that, I'm just going to show you by uh, using the transform tool, which you can get by, by hitting Q. If I were to hold down shift and, and try and scale this, you can see what's happening on the tab. The tab is also getting scaled, but I don't necessarily want that because the, the, it, it's, you know, I, I want to be able to have separate tabs in there. So I'm going to undo that. And uh, I'm just going to come on into, I'm going to right click, and I'm going to say properties, and enable guides for nine slice scaling. So now, when I double click in on my object, you're going to see we've got these intelligent guides. And it's called nine slice scaling because we have three boxes, excuse me, three boxes on top, three boxes in the middle, three boxes along the bottom, so that, that is up to nine. And I can drag these guides to make sure that only the areas of this object that are within the guides are going to scale whenever I try and do a transform on this object. And this is also has to do with, um, in ActionScript. If you try and scale an object and it has nine slice scale, it's not going to scale the way you, the, the, it, it's going to scale according to the nine slice guides. So I'm just going to go ahead and back up. And now when I try and transform this guy, as you can see, the tab stays uh, where it was supposed to and only uh, the area within the guides is scaling. And one last, uh, one last little 
uh, piece before we open it up to questions is Device Central. And, you know, I'm not sure if, if you uh, at, at McGraw-Hill are doing a lot of um, uh, mobile device stuff, but, uh, you know, the, the industry, the interactive industry seems to be moving very much in the, in the direction of getting everything out to mobile. And I know I use my mobile device for uh, a lot of different applications when I'm on the road. So, uh, you know, we have an example here of a, uh, a mobile application that uh, when I go ahead and try and test the movie, since I created it, when, when you go in to create a new file in Flash, you can create an ActionScript 3, an ActionScript 2. You can also create a Flash mobile presentation. And uh, if I were to go ahead and say Control Test Movie, it's not going to test it in the FLV, or I'm sorry, the SWF Previewer. It's going to test it within Adobe Device Central, which is a new application that ships with CS3. And oh, seems to be giving me an error. I guess I'm going to let's see. It. I believe it's a standalone player. Ah, yeah, there we go. Um, so now, as you can see, I've got a, a Nokia 5300. Um, is kind of the native device uh, over here on the left-hand side that I'm testing this with. Um, and uh, if I want to look at the Nokia 5300, I can just go to my device profiles and see uh, why it is that Device Central chose this particular device to play back my, uh, my emulator, my, my Flash project. And uh, if I double-click in there and I see it's 240 by 320, so we know in Device Central, by looking at the device profiles of the Nokia 5300, that the display size matches up with that. So you can actually, through Device Central, um, along the left-hand side here, you've got device profiles from pretty much every major manufacturer of, uh, of device, handheld devices. Um, you know, and this is updated on Adobe's website. If, if you go over, I'm just going to switch over really quickly to the... Uh, uh, Adobe Device Central Online, where uh, the device profiles are updated on uh, a pretty frequent basis. The, the most recent one was in June, so uh, you know another one is expected uh, pretty soon to um, you know to kind of keep up with all of the device releases over the last few months. So um, you know you can install that into uh, Device Central and basically be updated with all of the the most recent. And Adobe Updater, I believe, will inform you of that if you have a, a Adobe Updater uh, as part of your uh, CS3 install. So uh, through this emulator, I can basically just click through. And as you can see, I'm, I'm clicking through the, uh, the event uh, that I created within my Flash movie. And I have a lot of different options over here about how I'm going to, to view the emulation of this content. Um, if I created a screensaver or uh, something for the web browser or a wallpaper, um, I'll be able to, to view that. Um, kind of natively right there, and I get some info about the file size, right? This is a 52K uh, Flashlight 2, right? Flashlight is the, the mobile device platform. Uh, 3 is the most recent version um, that is shipping on, uh, I, I believe there's, uh, there's something, I, I can't remember how many millions of devices are enabled with Flashlight, but it's a, a pretty much the majority of the mobile device, um, especially when, uh, with mobiles, uh, Windows Mobile. So I'm able to kind of, you know, select the backlight here, and I can toggle that on and off. And if, if the phone has a, uh, a timeout functionality, I can view this. And if I don't interact with it, it'll time out within the specified number of seconds. I can look at, at my program, how it's going to look with uh, indoor lighting, right? You can see kind of a window reflection with outdoor lighting. Um, so you can see kind of clouds there with, with sunshine. Um, I can turn that off and, and bring the gamma up and down. I can see how the memory is used. So, for example, I've, I've got the, the memory viewer on. And if I were to just click here, you can see a little spike happens in the memory, right? And it's using 87% of the device's memory right now. And if I want to simulate the actual performance um, instead of, because right now I'm running this back on, um, on my computer, and so it's using my native uh, processor, to, so it's going to run ultra fast. But if I actually want to simulate the performance of, of what it will be on this device, First, I would have to cali click the Calibrate button, and, and it runs through a routine, and uh, I can change the rendering for low, medium, and high. So uh, now that we've uh, efficiently run over time, and I've just been uh, kind of motor-mouthing nonstop for the last hour, um, I'm just going to show you a few things before we open it up to questions, one of which is the, uh, the, developer, the Flash Developer Center. Uh, for those of us who are just getting ready or j just getting into Flash, um, 
we're going to find in the Developer Center a whole lot of uh, learning tools and introductory tools um, for, the, for the Flash user, right? So learning Flash and a Flash is on Adobe TV, which is a, a really great uh, series of, of just getting you started the way that I have, only a lot more in-depth. Um, ActionScript 3 tutorials, um, you know, getting started, uh, Flash learning guides, uh, ActionScript 3 samples. This is actually a really great, I've, I've been looking at this quite a bit to, to look at uh, ActionScript and, and uh, there's some great samples in there. Um, some quick starts and, and samples and downloads and a whole listing of community. Also, if uh, you learn a little bit more visually in the uh, Adobe.com Design Center, as you can see up here, we're, we're in the Design Center, there's a whole lot of video workshops that you can attend. And these, are, these range from uh, 10 minutes to 2 minutes. Um, and it's all kinds of visual video tutorials on um, you know, use, the interactivity with Flash, um, you know, how to export QuickTime files and optimizing animation and what have you. Um, and also in Device Central, you can look, uh, on Adobe.com, you can look up all, site, all types of information about Device Central. So with that, um, let, we can just open it up to questions for a little bit. And, uh, you know, this, this recording of this, if anybody has, uh, you know, wants to review it, this recording will be available, and we're going to, uh, Joe and I will email the link to this recording back to, uh, to is it Hitesh? Yep, you can send it back to me. Right, so we're we're going to send that back. So, uh, so yeah, whoever whoever has some some questions about the presentation or just about Flash in general, uh, I'm 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 here and, and we can. Take as much as I need. <laughs>